I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS. Uh, we've had a very rich morning, and now we're bringing things together over the, over the lunch hour with a discussion around the big picture, around uh, what are US choices. We're going to extend the reach of discussion into some broader security issues that connect to this. We've heard, already heard a good deal of discussion around some of that. Um, we are uh, joined by three uh, very distinguished and, and diverse uh, personalities who kindly agreed to be with us. Mike Gerson from the Washington Post and the One Campaign, uh, Dr. Zahir Salul, uh, president of the Syrian American Medical Society, and our colleague here, Kathleen, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, uh, head of our international security program. Uh, I'm going to offer just a few remarks and then turn to them to kick things off. Um, we, uh, uh, in reading through the commentaries from Mike and from Zahir and from many other people over the last six months around the evolving humanitarian situation, there's a couple of things that just jump out. And most of that is pretty negative. It's a strategic despair, to borrow Mike's term. It's a numbness. It's missed opportunities. It's a sense of, uh, of, of risk aversion and miscalculations and missed opportunities. There's a certain um, uh, pain and excruciating uh, uh, crisis of conscience around the responsibility to protect the, uh, the lack of progress in UN Security Council Resolution 2139 passed almost four months back. There's a sense that Assad is, is succeeding in, in the use of attacks, deliberate attacks upon civilians, uh, war crimes as a, as a tool of war with no accountability or limited accountability. We've seen the, the diplomacy collapse. We've seen Brahimi leave. Uh, we've seen the security situation become more chaotic and more inviting to an expansion of radical Islamists. And this week, we've seen, of course, a very dramatic uh, change, which is the, the projection of ISIS power uh, into uh, Nineveh province, uh, capture of Mosul, fall of Mosul, uh, following a, a projection into Fallujah and Anbar province in the, previous, in the previous period. So we have a new strategic dimension to this. We heard from uh, Jacob El Hilo that this, this creates Yet another set of uncertainties and, and key questions that have uh, big humanitarian consequences. So we wanted to focus our discussion here in getting the wisdom of these three individuals around where the picture is going and what are the opportunities for positive uh, pressure and interventions here. We know there's been a strong convergence of opinion around support for the notion of arming moderate opposition. That becomes a question of who and why and how as a practical matter. We know that there are real risks in all of this, and we'll hear more from our speakers. Risks of reprisals, risks of not being able to uh, guarantee security of partners. We know there's been a decline of some NGOs' capacities. We know that there's been kidnappings, hostage taking. People have been, ex uh, groups like uh, Mercy Corps, expelled from Damascus. Um, we know that there's a risk of being caught between of the humanitarian operations being caught between a continued violent uh, uh, effort from the Assad regime and then on the other side, uh, Islamist ext extremists who are hostile to these operations as well. So with that word of opening, let me turn to our speakers. I've asked each of them to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, roll through some initial opening thoughts. Uh, and get the, get the conversation going. We'll just move Mike, uh, Zahir, Kathleen. Thank you all for joining us. Sure. No, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start a little bit just by previewing my column tomorrow, and it's more venting. It's a, on the mode of the strategic despair. Um, and, but I want to broaden the venting just a little bit, um, because we've had the kind of testing. I think we've had the testing and exposure of two viewpoints when it comes to the Middle East right now. Um, one of them was expressed very recently in the President's West Point speech on uh, May 28th, um, where the President actually used the Middle East as a model, an example of restraint, talking about the success of risk aversion in some ways. Um, now, it's a, you know, it's a more complex picture than that because he does admit there are problems. Um, but he talks about, you know, warned against putting American troops uh, in the middle of a sectarian civil war. He talked about decimating Al Qaeda's core at the same time that the non-core, whatever it's called, was was uh, taking cities in eastern Syria. Um, 
talked about ramping up support for opponents when they really have not felt much of that uh, help, and they're now, uh, many are deeply skeptical. Um, talked about uh, the Counterterrorism Partnerships Fund, which seemed to lack urgency compared to the events that were taking place at the same time. Um, and I think we've seen some of the results of this cumulative uh, serial risk aversion in this process. Um, and that is the refusal to arm uh, responsible uh, opposition, which has meant there is no pressure to, uh, to have serious negotiations on the, on the part of the regime. regime. You talk with officials that were involved at Geneva, and there was really no plan except to hope for the uh, Russians and the Iranians to uh, provide diplomatic favors, which didn't happen. Um, and uh, many countries in the region that want to, have wanted to be involved, Turkey, the Gulf states, and others, have felt relatively leaderless um, and sometimes been irresponsible in this process in their support of Salafists. Um, and then the odd uh, inconsistencies of the policy where we are supporting um, with advanced weapons uh, the Iraqis uh, who are uh, fighting uh, militants in um, uh, western Iraq um, but are not forwarding, uh, supporting people who are 100 miles away across the border in Syria who are fighting the same enemies. Um, and it's uh, giving them strategic depth and uh, causing all sorts of problems. Um, so, and now we're seeing some of the results with militants who are operating on both sides of the border um, and destabilizing the Iraqi government in significant ways. So I think it's fairly clear that uh, there are risks to risk aversion and that uh, keeping the US out is not a sufficient definition of American interests in, in this region. Um, in fact, I, just to drive the point home, I think it would have taken tremendous affirmative effort just to achieve containment in this, in this situation in, uh, in Syria, um, involving a balance of power that would encourage some kind of power sharing arrangement between non-horrible elements of the opposition and non-horrible elements of the regime, which has really remained Syria's only hope that I can see. Um, I'll throw in, though, that I've seen another argument that has come more from the conservative side, um, that it, somehow it, it's not a bad outcome for Assad's forces and Sunni militants to be killing one another, fighting one another. You often hear that argument on the right. Um, and uh, you know we're just seeing in, the, in this immediate context that it's both immoral, it's you know, countenancing this slaughter of, of innocent civilians, but it's also stupid. Um, it's only, um, it's only a stalemate if it doesn't produce a crop of battle-hardened extremists who destabilize uh, neighboring countries and board planes that, and go other places. And you know, we all know there are hundreds of, uh, of um, people fighting in these forces from Germany and the UK and France and other places. Um, so the challenge after years of relative inaction is to, um, uh, is for this administration to adopt a role that it doesn't seem to have much appetite for, which may involve the saving the Iraqi government and actively encouraging support for Syrian opposition to equalize the, the playing field, um, and bolstering state institutions in Lebanon and a variety of other countries. Um, and so uh, that, to me, uh, you know, we're going to test that in, in fairly short order. Uh, we need to have a comprehensive regional approach to prevent this from spilling out in ways that are even worse than it is now. Um, and uh, uh, so that's what I'm writing tomorrow. Thank you, Mike. Saka. Um, let me start with this um, uh, Arabic uh, saying. Uh, for those who understand Arabic, I'm going to say it first in Arabic, then I'll try to translate it. It's difficult to translate sometimes uh, Arabic to English. Uh, the, the saying is, which means that uh, if you hear a mountain thunder, uh, if you hear the noise coming from the mountain, you expect that something big will come out of the mountain. And uh, in that saying, it says the mountain delivered a mouse. 
a small animal. So sometimes, you know, when I talk with my friends in Syria, colleagues in Syria, and I tell them about my government, the United States of America, sending medical supplies and medications and, and so forth, and that we spend $2 billion in humanitarian assistance, which I'm really very proud of, they tell me, great, but we expect much more from the United States of America, being the superpower of the world. So people in Syria are looking at us for much more than humanitarian assistance. And we're talking about Syrian doctors, Syrian engineers, Syrian attorneys, women, and all of them uh, understand that we can deliver much more than what we uh, have done over the past three years and so forth. And this is a picture which I chose just to put to give you an idea about what we are saying and what we're facing every day in Syria. This is a child, his name is Abdullah, 12 years old in the city of Aleppo. Aleppo is divided uh, in half between an opposition-controlled area and government-controlled area. So this is the largest trauma hospital in the opposition-controlled area. This is a child who was playing in the neighborhood when a barrel bomb fell on the neighborhood. He passed out. He was brought to the emergency room. And the physicians who are there, who are trained by our organizations, the hospital was supported by medical supplies and medical equipment by our organizations paid by tax money. And they were trying to insert a chest tube in him, but they did not have local anesthesia. So he was screaming. He said, I wanted my mother. I wanted my mother. And then he said to the physician who was trying to insert the, uh, the chest tube, I kiss your hand if you can stop hurting me. He, they did not have local anesthetic, which is something which is very simple, but because of the shortage of supplies, they did not have it. His life was saved, but many other children are dying every day in Syria and also uh, civilians because they do not have access to health care. They do not have to access to hospitals that they can be treated and saved. This hospital was, by, by the way, uh, bombed by a guided missile. Uh, but fortunately, it only destroyed the upper floor, so they can still, uh, the emergency room can operate and so forth. Um, so if we look at uh, our policy in Syria, um, and we can judge this policy based on the stated goals of the policy from the beginning. Um, I'm a physician, I'm a critical care specialist, so when I talk with my students and residents about what we are doing in this critically ill patients, what, our, what are our goals in treatment, they tell me, first of all, save the lives, save the kidneys, save the brain, save the heart, and we, then we try to judge scientifically whether we are accomplishing this. The stated goals of our policy in Syria were, first of all, of course, to end the crisis, secondly, to legit, delegitimize Assad by applying um, diplomatic uh, isolation and economic sanction, Thirdly, to contain the crisis within Syria and protect our allies in the region. Uh, fourthly, hopefully to reduce the humanitarian suffering of the Syrian people. So are we accomplishing this? And maybe uh, you can add to it is the prevention of chemical weapon use in Syria. That was uh, additional policy that was added after the Ghouta uh, August 21st attacks. If you look at each one of them, and you can judge yourself, I don't have to expand on this, you will see clearly that our policies or stated goals of policies are not working. If anything, they are getting, I mean, the, the, whether it's humanitarian um, uh, conditions in Syria or delegitimizing de Assad or um, contain, prevent, prevention of chemical weapon, if anything, it's getting worse. Recently, there have been uh, uh, several incidents of using chlorine gas instead of sarin gas in Syria, um, which lead to the same consequences, scaring the population, killing some people, and making some people more displaced. So chemical weapons has been used. The humanitarian situation is getting worse. I was just going to throw some numbers. I'm sure that each one of you have a lot of numbers about what's happening in Syria. We estimated in the last two years that 200,000 Syrians have died because of no access to medical care, have died of chronic diseases, of high blood pressure, related complications, heart disease, cancer. Uh, chronic renal failures because they, because they do not have access to medications or health care. And these numbers are not mentioned in the media. By the end of this panel discussion, we will have additional, additional 3,000 Syrians who are displaced inside Syria and outside Syria. Every day, according to the United Nations, 9,500 Syrians are displaced inside and outside Syria. So definitely, the humanitarian situation is not getting better. If anything, it's getting worse. I've been in Aleppo several times in the last six months, and every time is worse than time before. The only positive aspect that I've seen this last visit to Aleppo, that ISIS was not present in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. 
In October, it was present, and people expected ISIS to control Aleppo. This time, they were not present. It was actually safer for me to come from Turkey to Aleppo, except for the threat of the barrel bombing, which is tolerated compared to what ISIS can do uh, to you if they kidnapped you and so forth. And also, people are turned off against ISIS. You know, mm -hmm. they hated this organization. In October, you would say half and half. Some people were say, oh, this, is, this could be a good uh, group that is fighting Assad. Now, everyone knows that this group is, first of all, very extremist. They're not compatible with the Syrian culture and society. And they're, if anything, they're coordinating at some level with Assad. That's the perception within the Syrian society. Um, maybe I can end on this uh, with my comments, and then we can expand later Thank on. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks very much, Steve, for inviting me here. Um, I think I'll just start by saying that the, the hardest thing, um, I think, for the American public and for certainly the, the Washington establishment um, is to admit how wrong we were in terms of our sense that Assad was going to fall with uh, relative speed. I put that on the scale of the amount of time that, that we've been looking at the Syria crisis. And so, the set of factors that may have guided US policy decisions in the past just aren't true anymore. And that's a very hard reality, I think, because what it means today is that the most important thing the United States can try to do is get to the negotiating table, get Assad to the negotiating table. And he's operating from a position of power, and that's where we see all the continuing humanitarian crises stemming from, that, that struggle. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about what I see going on in the broader region with respect to the humanitarian and, and other and terrorism related aspects of Syria, and then just a few thoughts on, on how you get to that get to that end state, which um, which is decidedly difficult. You know, we have trouble applying American power today in the Middle East, and Syria is the absolute quintessential example of that. We have trouble with our economic tools of, of statecraft, the sanctions which are significant that we have applied, seeming to have the pressure that we expect it to have. Um, our diplomatic efforts seem stymied and weak, frankly, um, in the midst of the inability to pull the opposition together, in the midst of other international actors and, and what they've chosen to do, uh, Russians and others. Um, our cultural norms are really at stake here, where we are a country that is seen as upholding both humanitarian principles and rule of law, and certainly the chemical weapons um, principles, and those are at stake. And then, of course, there's the military tool, where the United States is not looking for another um, place to engage an Islamic public in any kind of struggle. Um, we are not looking for another place to spend blood and treasure, American blood and treasure, after a very difficult period for the United States, and yet, um, we, we don't seem to be able to craft a solution set without it. So what are the consequences of that? Well, I guess I would say if, if our de facto uh, policy has been to contain the crisis to Syria, uh, we, we failed at that. So I think we start there maybe in terms of a public discourse. Um, the evidence is overwhelming. Certainly what's happened in Iraq, I'll just start there because that's the most obvious place um, from al-Nusra and then ISIS and now ISIL and uh, the takeover of Mosul um, is certainly evidence enough that the crisis in Syria and our efforts to use these powers uh, have not succeeded. Um, of course, you have the refugee and humanitarian issues that have spilled over, with which you are all very familiar, particularly for Jordan and Turkey, but others. You also have Syrian Turkish skirmishes, um, both on the border and in the air, and those could continue and worsen and create larger crises. You, of course, have Israeli strikes in Lebanon that are linked to the Syrian crisis. You have um, accusations of Iranian equipment flying in, um, also linked to the, uh, to the uh, Israeli role. You have um, what seems to be essentially a, a slow hollowing out or breaking down of the convention on um, chemical weapons, particularly if you think about the chlorine barrel bombs as a form of chemical weapons. You see that not really being enforced, which has significant implications presumably down the road for countries that may choose to use those kinds of weapons. And of course you have, bringing us back to August of last year, the red line issue and the question of what credibility consequences are at stake for the United States as we've seen play out in other um, locations, whether it was in Ukraine, 
uh, whether it was in East Asia and the, in um, terms of maritime disputes, there's this continuing sense that what we have done in Syria is ble or, or not done has bled out into broader issues for US foreign policy. So I think that <clears throat> is part of the argumentation, the reason I'm running through that it's part of the argumentation about how you get a consensus to start to build around the Syria problem. This is not just about Syria. As severe as it is just for Syrians, it's about a broader US foreign policy dilemma. And that's not even touching on these longer term trends of Shia Sunni um, uh, uh, divides that are significant and worsening, again, with the Iraq example being the most recent. So, what do you do about it? Let me just end quickly on that. As I said at the beginning, I think the key is to acknowledge that this isn't about uh, getting rid of Assad in some sort of quick, almost quixotic manner um, with a unified opposition. We're not there. We've tried a long time, and, and I think the difficulty now is to admit that we need to get to the negotiating table, and how do you do that? I think a lot of the pieces of how you do that are in place in mild ways, and I think they need to be stepped up significantly. Uh, one, of course, is pay medical assistance, food for um, the moderate opposition. I think you have to strengthen that moderate opposition um, in order to give the population an alternative because they don't want to line up behind al Nusra or any of these other groups, um, extremists who are proving themselves out to be um, uh, both untrustworthy and not role models for the kind of governance that they're looking for. And then I think you have to carry out the decisions that have already been made to train and equip um, the opposition, again, really not so much in terms of significantly changing the military balance, but changing the military balance enough that you can get the humanitarian crisis on the table as a negotiate, negotiating issue so you can get to some kind of a solution. And then I'll just conclude by saying from a security perspective, we have to continue to just be laser focused on all those um, neighboring countries. Jordan, we've been worrying about a lot. I think we've done a decent job with Jordan. Iraq, obviously not so <laughs> great a job with Iraq. A lot more work to be done there, very complicated. And then, and then the other neighboring states. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, let's talk a bit about arming the moderate opposition. And uh, I'm going to ask Zahir to say a few words. Who are they? Um, what are we giving them? What do we need to give them? What do they need? And how quickly will that actually, in your view, change the equation, realistically? I mean, the, the editorial pages are full of a very diverse group of people making the case for this as something that needs to be done and should be done. Can you say a bit more about who, why, how does this get done, and how quickly do we see results? Well, I mean, thank you, Steve, for uh, putting this, uh, all of this burden on me. Uh, <laughs> of course, uh, as a Syrian physician, I know everything. You know, see, when you, when you uh, ride with a taxi driver in Syria, they will tell you everything about what's happening in the world and so forth. So Syrians are, by nature, expert on everything. You know, so, so I will mention a few things. I, I've watched the movie Return to Homs the um, uh, day before yesterday for the first time. Um, I'm from the city of Homs, by the way. My family still live there. And I recommend you to watch the city of Hamas because it gives you a very um, realistic, it's a documentary, a realistic narrative about what happened from the beginning of the crisis when people started to have a demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations, and how some of them carried arms, and then eventually some of them became extremists. So you will see evolution of one of the um, act, not actors, the main uh, uh, persons in that uh, documentary. Uh, his name is Basad Sarut. Uh, we're what, witnessing tonight the World Cup, the beginning of the World Cup. Um, my uh, team is Argentine, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and he was the goalkeeper of the Syrian national team. So he, he was a big shot in Syria. He started to um, you know, go to demonstrations and uh, have the slogans that we want freedom and we want change and so forth. Then he carried arms and he became a leader of one of these groups, the moderate group, the FSA. Um, and uh, then you had defected soldiers from the army also who joined these groups. And every city, you had people or groups or battalions that wanted to protect the neighborhoods and wanted to get rid of the regime that they considered uh, army and that they considered oppressor and so forth. And they protect the dignity, as they were saying. Uh, so these moderate groups, with time, because they felt that the international community that 
gave them a lot of slogans to support and uh, rhetorics to support, whether it's Turkey or Saudi Arabia or even President Obama. They interpreted the messages that we were giving them that we will support them, that we will send them arms, that we will send them uh, medical supplies, that we will send them cash money so they can sustain themselves and, and, their, and their families. And we did not do that. We did not deliver on this. Unfortunately, many of them now became and Nusra and ISIS, some of the mm -hmm. same people who started non-violent, then they carried arm and they were the moderate now, they became um, extremists because this is the only game in town that is fighting Assad and the, on, the, the, the most disciplined people who are fighting Assad are right now the Al Nusra, not ISIS, it used to be ISIS in the past. Um, but we still have a lot of moderate oppositions. We're talking about the fighting opposition, mm -hmm. of course. We have differentiated between the political oppositions in the outside and the inside fighting battalions. We still have a lot of moderates who are controlling large territories, whether it's Aleppo or Idlib or Dar'a in the south or Hunaytira, and these people need a lot of support. From cash money, simple cash money, to just the green light. They need the green light. They need the understanding from our government that we will support them and let other government to support them. That's what they are looking for. And they are not, until now, they're not getting this messages clear from our administrations that we will be with you until you have political transition and until you force Assad to compromise. We are not getting that. Mike? Yeah, I would only add in just a maybe small anecdote that illustrates some of that point. When I was at Zatri at the last time, at the end of last year, I met with a group of new refugees. I think they'd come from Dara area um, and um, asked them about these divisions and their sympathies were clearly with the FSA. Um, that's like the home team. And they view, they talked about ISIL as foreigners. Okay. They, you know, as non-Syrian in their mm -hmm. approach. But then I asked them about al-Nusra and the response was, they give us food, they give us help. Um, and so there's been a huge imbalance here in the way that this is, is uh, treated. We, I, the encouraging thing in all this is that I talked with some like US officials when, when I was there and Everybody talks about uh, Syria as a stalemate, as a military stalemate, but in fact, it's quite fluid internally. Mm -hmm. So overall, it's a stalemate, but there, it, internally, it's, it's quite fluid. And FSA makes gains in some areas and has along the border, um, this, the, the uh, Jordanian border. And, um, and so from that side, you talk with US officials that say, I think we can isolate the people that we can help. We should help in these circumstances. It's not hopeless, we can disaggregate. They think that it's possible. Okay. And then you talk with some aid officials uh, who, and others, some who work in the country who d express a very deep uh, skepticism um, that uh, the Islamists are much better fighters, that they'll take the weapons, that uh, this is a hopeless uh, mm -hmm. task. Um, I was told the story by someone who should know when I was there the last time that the FSA had been, certain area had been trying to take a series of checkpoints from the regime checkpoints, on major roads or whatever, and um, for weeks or months, and that the, uh, I, and I don't forget which, I forget which group, there are many, mm -hmm. that, uh, but an Islamist, uh, much more militantly Islamist group came in and took some of the, with the uh, points with suicide bombers and did it in a couple of days. Um, and there's just an impression on the ground that they're really good, that they're very effective. And um, so those are the combating tendencies uh, when, you're, when you're there. I mean, there's a, a uh, you know, can you disaggregate? Can you make these decisions? Um, and I, I think, I, you know, to, to your point that um, a significant number of U.S. government people seem to think they can, that this is not an impossible task. Um, and, but the, the efforts just seem to have been very incremental. Now, what's the change that, uh, in terms of the fall of Mosul and suddenly the, the notion that this conflict in Syria has broken out, it's, it's expanded, it's projected out, does that, does that, in your view, does that create back pressure on, in some ways, to open the cross border and the cross line relief in some fashion? Is it, what we heard this morning from Yakub El Hilo was there is a very intense and active debate going on in the UN, at 
the Security Council around these issues. And it was hard to know what that, whether that's on some trajectory or whether that's just a continued churning. But the strategic situation has changed right now. And does that open, does that create greater opportunity to put intense pressure on that particular point and to push towards a Chapter 7 Security Council resolution or to push for compromise on cross-border? I mean, I mean, definitely there is a, a thriving civic society in uh, areas like Aleppo and Idlib uh, who need sustained support from the international community so they can overcome and they can challenge the extremists. We're talking about uh, civic councils that are um, elected hmm. by the um, population in Aleppo, in Idlib, in many of the villages in these areas. And these are the largest uh, population areas in northern Syria. And we have similar situation in Daraa in southern Syria. If we have sustained, comprehensive cross-border effort that oversee, overseen by the United Nations, then definitely that will lead to improvement, first of all, of the humanitarian situation. You will see uh, resettlement or repatriation of the refugees coming back from Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, stoppage of the displacement of the population, and then for time for the civic society to breathe so they can start rebuilding and thinking of development. Um, as long as we do not have the presence of the international community in Aleppo and Idlib and northern Syria and in Dar'a, then the situation will continue to deteriorate and people will only uh, hope that ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra will continue to fight Assad. Uh, definitely in Bab al-Salama and Bab al-Hawa, which are the major cross uh, border crossing from Turkey to Idlib and Aleppo, if we can have um, uh, the authorization of the Turkish authorities, to let the United Nations to do that, then we can reach about five million people in northern Syria, in Idlib and Aleppo, and that, that is very significant. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Kath Kathleen, you wanted to say I was something? just gonna add on that, uh, th you know, on the, uh, on the Iraqi-Syrian border, there, was, there were already reports that the um, ISIL extremists who went into Mosul um, took a tank back over the sand line in the border and erased it in a, in a symbolic gesture of the removal of the border between Syria and Iraq. So my only point was going to be more that the, what, first of all, the, the cross-border element is de facto already in play, and it doesn't all, it's not all for the good depending on which border. I agree on the Turkish border, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. I think on the Iraq border, and potentially that will grow, there, there's threat as well as opportunity there. I, I would just throw in that uh, I'm not, a lot of this is whether Assad feels isolated by mm -hmm. this, and I'm not sure that he does. I mean, mm -hmm. you've given interviews in the last couple of days saying, well, this proves the, the threat of Sunni extremism, mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. is coming around to my position, and much of the world is, in, you know, increasingly in my camp. Um, and, you know, sometimes the delusions of dictators matter. And uh, in, this, in, in this case, I'm not sure he feels more isolated by what's going on, mm -hmm. so. And clearly, um, he continues to hold the threat of reprisal, right? I mean, there are four million people being served right. from the Damascus side, and uh, that threat has been used continually to block UN agencies from, from mm -hmm. winning compliance with Turkey or others for cross-border operations. Why don't we open to, to our audience for comments and questions. We'll bundle together three or four. Uh, just put your hands up, and we have, we'll start over on this side, sir, right here, and, and, and then two doors down. Yes. Hi, I'm John Glenn with U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Thank you all very much for a dispiriting but important conversation. I guess part of what I'd like to pick up on is what the U.S. role and how we're looking at this in part seems to me to be shaped by the challenging sense we have that the U.S. alone could somehow change and make the situation different, which makes me want to ask you about the prospects for other players and other partners with which to do that. The U.N. may be one, but let's just put out right away with Russia as Assad's, you know, sort of backer, that seems unlikely. Doesn't mean you don't have to do it. But I'll put out there, at least there's the action in NATO this morning that Turkey is requested to convene. There's the question I have about other Gulf states who have interests that might align. And even for that matter, is there any opportunity 
for the horrible things that have happened this week for the government in Iraq, for al-Maliki, to suddenly change to come around in there. Because I think the challenge is, is, the, is the clear sense that we can't simply make things different on the ground alone. And yet this isn't some sort of broad call for everyone to get together and hold hands. It's instead a more strategic question about how we can get other people who have interest in that region to be moving forward. Thank you. Could you just hand that over to? Hello, uh, Eric Ashcroft, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And uh, my question is about arming the moderate Syrian groups. Do we have a sense of what type of arms and how much of it we would have to actually supply to uh, material, materially change the balance of power, especially given the fact that Assad still has international backers? So I guess what would be the risk that we would just maintain the same level, but everyone would have better weapons? Thank you. Sir? Yeah, uh, Ken Meyer, Cord World Docs. Uh, it's widely understood that Saudi Arabia has been uh, supporting the rebels, and it's well documented that the rebels have engaged in a number of acts of terror. Do you think it would help if the State Department placed Saudi Arabia on the list of states sponsoring terrorism? And in fact, if we arm the rebels, as the panel seems to think would be a good idea, uh, might we not have to place ourselves on that list? Ron Waldman up front here. Thanks. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the notion that Assad is in collaboration with ISIS. Who'd like to start off? I mean, I'm going to start with uh, some comments. I mean, maybe not direct response uh, to the questions. I mean, I'm going to use a, a page book of Assad's responses usually. He doesn't answer the <laughs> by, by the way, he's my classmate. We graduated from the same medical school. I met with him uh, after he became a president three times. And uh, the first time I met with him was one year after he became a president. And we were uh, doing our international conference in Syria, Syrian American Medical Society. And he said that he uh, would love to become a doctor, not a president. And then I told him, I heard that uh, there is openness in Syria and that you're trying to make a change. And are you planning to introduce democracy in Syria? And he had this very long response. Most of us were yawning at the, the response. And then he said, the Syrians are not ready for democracy. Um, and uh, I think he was asked the same question by the Wall Street Journal two months before the first demonstration in Dar'a. And he said the same thing. Um, so it looks like he is in a mindset that he's convinced. Um, um, I believe that he convinced that what's happening right now is a global conspiracy against him and against Syria, and he's fighting the good fight. And uh, I think he believes that. Um, now, in terms of arming the opposition, um, I think what we need to focus on is arming the Syrian people with the tools that will help them to rebuild Syria. Uh, and also to protect the population, the civilian population. I think this is a very basic moral thing to do. You know, when um, our government intervened in Bosnia, in Kosovo, I didn't hear that much criticism of what we have done. We protected the population. We saved Bosnia. We saved Kosovo. And we, could do, we can do the same thing in Syria. When we're talking about 162,000 Syrians killed in three years, when we're talking about the largest humanitarian crisis in our time, when we're talking about half of the population being displaced and we're doing nothing as a world, I think this is really shame on us. So we, we, we should have done much more than what we have done from the beginning of the crisis. But until now, we have this debate whether we need to arm the opposition or not. We should have no fly zone to protect the Syrian civilians from being bombed every day by, by barrel bombs. We should, have, we should have moved maybe earlier, much earlier, to prevent Assad from using chemical weapons. He's still fooling us and using different type of chemical weapons that he did not declare in the treaty. And we are believing them. We're actually hiding these news reports because we don't want to embarrass ourselves. So yes, I believe that we have to arm the Syrian people with the tool that to protect themselves. This is our duty as the, the superpower in the world, as the international, international community. The United Nations has the responsibility to protect civilians. We're not doing that. Well, we're not, we don't hear that debate in the media and in the public about the responsibility of protect civilians anymore. Uh, I think it's shame on us that we are letting this go when we're still debating bits and pieces of the policy. Kathleen, the question John raised about our broader strategy of engagement with other interests. Yeah, yeah. let me, let me uh, touch on that, and then I actually like to take on a couple, couple of the others. Um, 
Yeah, the United States has been for some time very much, I'm sure as you know, John, engaged with the Gulf states, certainly with NATO, um, particularly particular allies within NATO are, um, uh, you know, more concerned about Syria maybe than some others, and they have been quite active. We have, for example, both the Germans and the Dutch uh, have deployed Patriot batteries in a defensive mode on Turkish soil to help protect Turkey. That's one example of states that have chosen to step up their um, responsiveness. And the United States, by the way, has done the same. Um, so yes, they're, part, they're absolutely part of the solution set. I think in particular on the Gulf state piece, they are. The issue, I think, is how much can we sway, how much suasion do we have to point them in the right direction? This, in some cases, gets to the other question about how the Gulf states and the Saudis are engaging um, uh, in the region, and particularly in terms, I'm assuming, of arming. Um, so I think the more we step in, and, and again, I am not saying this easily, I don't believe the United States should be stepping in everywhere in the world all the time, but um, I think as I've laid out, there, there are reasons here for us to move ahead off of the policy we have had. And we do have, if you will, on the books, the policy of, um, of providing some arms and assistance. And here's where I think we can provide a helpful normative role in terms of who gets armed, how. Um, we think very hard about that, as do the Europeans. And I think we can bring, um, as we have skin in the game, so the saying goes, we can help to shape that more than is being done today. So let me jump to that piece, which is um, both the, the question about the material balance of power and the, the, I'll just say, on the issue of the US being a state sponsor of terrorism. I wouldn't consider the US arming the German opposition in World War II state sponsor of terrorism. So I, I see no analogy here to what the US would do in the way in which we do it. And frankly, I'm very convinced of the care that we take, at least in this administration, and how we do those things. Um, there, there's no way that we, if you believe in just use of force on any level, you know that there are um, consequences you can't take, take all uh, control of, but you have to do it with a just mindset about how you're, um, how you're trying to change the lives, frankly, of people on the ground and save lives. And, and I think that would clearly be where the US mindset would be. On the material balance of power, that has been the number one issue that has stymied us for years, and that's why I brought up the time scale issue. If you thought Assad was gonna go quickly, then it didn't make any sense, right, to arm, because the throughput it takes, the, the degree of size and scale of a program to arm and to do it in this very careful way, make sure it's going to the right people, vetting the right people, getting the equipment there, that has never looked to make sense because of the time scale. I'm suggesting that that has shifted over time and that, you know, I'm not sure it'll make a huge material difference, and I said that very explicitly, but I think we can make enough of a difference to shift the calculus of actors. That includes Assad, it includes the extremists, includes those states outside the region who are maybe arming the extremists, um, and it, it could include Russia. So I think to the extent that we are able to start putting into practice a responsible program that we've already stated we're going to do, maybe already are doing on some level, um, but make clear that the United States is intent on shifting that over time. It probably won't significantly overnight shift the balance. The throughput is very difficult, but I think it can make a difference, and I think it's time we try. Mike. I guess I'd, only, I'd strongly agree with your point that if the theory is that when America stands down, others stand up, it often doesn't work that way. If the theory is America gets engaged uh, leading other allies, um, it, it works better in a circumstance like this. And one of the explicit reasons that members of the administration um, that I talked to early in this process wanted the US more engaged in arming uh, moderate rebels was to provide that kind of quality control and leadership in this circumstance. Um, and you know, the, the Saudis in particular, and they're mentioned, and they've, you know, they have huge problems, but part of their frustration has been they go ahead and do things when they haven't felt like we led. Um, when I was there last, there are Saudi trucks every night that go across that border into, into Syria. Um, 
And I, I, you know, people, aid people aren't quite sure exactly what goes on, but uh, you know, they have had huge frustration with US policy and they've you know, done a bunch of things themselves. I think the US could play a much more strategic role in determining uh, you know, how that works. So I, I agree on that side. Um, the, uh, on the arming side, it's an unfortunate reality that a single Russian cargo ship bringing arms uh, to the Syrians um, is more than what we're talking about um, in, in months of arming in, of, of the rebels. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's hopeless. So people I've talked to recently, you know, they would want to get started just by the ability to shoot down a few helicopters. Right. Okay? And having that just begin to change the calculation of the regime when they move people and material, um, that they have to think about it. Because right now, it's not even uh, part of the calculation. That would be a big advance with a fairly small uh, uh, you know, military investment. Um, so c clearly when you're not doing much, there are some things you can do that would give both the regime and the Iranians and others pause as they uh, conduct operations within the country. And I think that's, that's part of the hope. So. Ron had raised a question around linkage, allegations of a linkage between Assad and ISIS. Do you have any, I, mean, it's <coughs> I don't know much about that. I would say that Assad has benefited from making this conflict more sectarian. Do you agree with that? Oh, I mean, def oh definitely. Right. And so. so it's an odd alliance of influences, uh, you know, of interests with some other elements here. And you know, I know from having government experience that Assad was either actively or passively you know, allowing a lot of, of Sunni foreign fighters to go through Syria into Iraq. Um, uh, that direction during the Iraq war was a major problem. Um, and he certainly looked the other way at least uh, in, in, the, in that circumstance. But I don't know the detail. Of, uh, I mean, there are a few things about this issue that, uh, in the first the speech that Assad gave uh, in the beginning of the demonstrations, like one month after the beginning of the demonstrations, he mentioned that there is a conspiracy and we have a foreign fighters and we have terrorists. At that time, there was nothing like that. And this became self-fulfilling policy uh, prophecy that I think he created. He released in the, from the prison of um, uh, Adra, near Damascus, the leaders of current ISIS, and knowing that they will go into That's the true. other side and they will organize and so forth. I mean, I can tell you that in Aleppo, everyone knew, for example, where's the headquarter of Jabhat al-Nusra, which was never bombed in, during the crisis. Everyone knows that al raqqa is the center of ISIS in Syria, and al raqqa is barely being attacked by the Syrian government. I mean, this kind of, uh, which gives you an idea that whether there is direct collaboration or Assad is trying to uh, indirectly let them get stronger so he can tell the world, see, I'm fighting terrorists on your behalf. Thank you. Len, and then uh, in the back here. Uh, we started this discussion with the West Point speech, which seemed to shut the door on any further action. And since then, two things have happened. One is Ambassador Ford has gone very public, uh, showing the kind of fractures within the administration. The second is the Iraq crisis. So I'm wondering if any of you can illuminate the debate that's going on, if any, within the administration. Thank you. There's a, yes, please identify yourself. Yes, hi, my name is Mary Zell. Um, first of all, thank you so much to our, to our three panelists. Um, I, my question is primarily for you, Dr. Hicks, um, and I'd like to push a little more on this shift, sh what you mentioned as shifting the balance, and so, the goal of arming the moderate opposition that many of you have mentioned is to shift the balance to create a stalemate, to, to push the sides to a negotiating table. I think we're all on the same, the same page there. But several of the panelists have also alluded to the role of Russia. And so my question is, if by arming the opposition, don't we risk contributing to a sustained proxy war that could go on for decades rather than actually shifting the balance? And how do we meet that challenge and how do we plan for that? Thank you. Yes. Others? Why don't we come back then? Who would like to jump I in? I can start yeah. on the, the proxy war question. Look, I, I, um, 
I, I think that is overstating it. I think if your question is, could there be, could we be looking at decades, uh, or maybe a decade, of conflict, I think that is a possibility. We're looking at that now. Um, you know, I don't, I do think we are, as, as, as was mentioned, it's, it's very fluid on the ground, so stalemate isn't quite the right term, and I certainly am not saying arm to a balance that creates a stalemate. I'm saying arm and create dynamics that create um, less of an imbalance so you can get people to the negotiating table. And, and again, my thought would be to put humanitarian issues at the forefront of that conversation at the negotiating table. So you may not resolve all political or military issues, but you may create enough of a shift that allows more humanitarian assistance than you have today. So are there risks in arming? Absolutely, absolutely. The, and we have been um, in that position for many years. I'm suggesting that I think there's enough, of an evi there's enough evidence that this is not resolving uh, uh, in and of itself and that the crisis is getting out of control and that arming is one piece um, of a solution set that can h help to start save lives over the long term. Yeah, I'm not necessarily the right person to talk to about divisions within the administration, but I, I do know that this has been a two-sided argument since the very beginning. I mean, there were serious voices on both sides of the arming uh, debate that emerged into stories about this question, and whether it was Petraeus and Hillary Clinton or certain White House staff on this issue. Um, so it's been a fully debated issue within the administration. They've just come down pretty decisively on one side. Um, and I think that reflects the president's view and some of his key White House uh, staff. Um, my, you know, having been in government, I actually find many of the individual decisions that have been made in this crisis to be understandable given the political and geopolitical context. Um, and then my concern, as I was trying to express at the beginning, is just that when you add them up serially, um, they add up to uh, real confusion about the role that America wants to play in, the, in, in this uh, debate. Um, the, uh, on the proxy war question, I just, I don't think that's been the issue. I think right now, uh, to put it bluntly, a lot of people that, that are in essence proxies of one side in this struggle don't feel like they've had reliable sponsors. Um, while the other side has been all in, 100%. Um, whether it's the Russians or Hezbollah or the regime, um, the, you know, they are, have been committed to military victory using the most brutal methods of modern warfare you can possibly imagine. Um, and under those circumstances, I, I agree that it's, I, it, it's a moral commitment to give the ability to people to, def to, to, people to defend themselves in, when they are the, the objects. What strikes me when I talk with refugees when I'm there is that um, uh, civilians' casualties are not the byproducts of the conflict in many ways. Civilians are often the targets of one side of this conflict, which is a violation of the rule of law, of, of war, um, and, and represents crimes against humanity. So there is a moral element here. Um, as we engage in this and with helping people to defend themselves, when they themselves, when neighborhoods are targets in this battle. So on that, on that line, what should be done now? I mean, clearly there is mounting evidence of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity. What, do, what are you advising in terms of actions that should be taken now to sort of lay the groundwork for accountability? Should this be a priority, or is this seen as something that's a bit, really, a bit too long-term and a bit extraneous? Or do you see this as something that really should be a priority? I think it is a priority, and I think it is actively a priority. That's been my experience. I've been out of the administration for over a year, but that is, yeah. you know, my uh, um, memory, and uh, is that exactly those issues are are being sort of cataloged. I think the execution of that, as we all know, would be incredibly difficult. But the, 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 you know, the, the dossiers, if you will, are built and being mm -hmm. built and taken account of. And I think the president's very committed to um, protecting civilians in, in, um, 
in, in uh, I know that's hard to hear, in, um, in those kinds of situations and using the, the rule of law as we can to do that. The question is whether you ever get these people, you know, right. as it has been a question in every conflict from, from, from Bosnia and, and before. But I do think that's a priority if, if ever you're able to get to prosecution. I mean, the only thing that I would like to add on this is that uh, in order to have reconciliation in Syria and prevention, even worsening of uh, the humanitarian situation, um, I mean, you can foresee uh, definitely a scenario where you have a huge displacement of the other population right now in Syria that are so far been spared by the crisis if there is no sense of justice. So um, I think accountability and putting the war criminals, especially leaders of war crimes, to justice in some type of tribunal is very important in order to preserve what's left from the fabrics of the Syrian society and prevent further revenge attacks and under, you know, against minorities that are perceived as supportive of the regime. Um, we're talking right now about a sense in Syria that uh, without the support of certain elements of the Syrian society, the regime would not have sustained this brutality over the past three and a half years. So there should be some type of justice at the international level. I, I would only add that there are some recent examples of Syrians themselves who have smuggled out pictures of torture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to provide right. evidence of what went on. And I think that's often important, not just to the international community, but to, to Syrians themselves. So. Um, in our earlier panels, earlier roundtables, we tried to close with coming back to the speakers and asking them to reflect on what do you think is the basis for hope looking forward? And what do you look to as the, as the, the, the light in the picture that, that you think we want, you want to leave us with as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a positive end to this conversation? Mike, you want to? Yeah, I would only say that the, the hope I've had is not been reading articles about the strategic situation in Syria, which is pretty depressing. It's, it's going to Zatri and visiting people in the communities, uh, you know, community-based refugees um, who are, uh, you know, Zatri is not a hopeless place. Um, these are not people <coughs> that are in a, um, I've been to hopeless refugee camps. Um, and this is enormously vital, highly educated, people that want to get back to their country. They have high expectations. It's a different population. Sometimes refugee populations um, are dispirited um, and the morale is broken. Um, many of these are middle class people that want to get back to build their country. Um, and uh, so I've, I don't end up, I haven't ended up, you hear horrible stories, but I haven't ended up when I visit with refugees, you know, they're not despairing in many circumstances, and that to me is the, the source of hope they want to build their country. So, uh -huh. I just want to reiterate and emphasize on this issue, and uh, I just want to mention that Syria is not a Congo um, or Sudan. Um, with all respect to Sudanese and Congolese, uh, Syria uh, historically have a sense of um, history and unity Syrians overcome many tragedies and disasters throughout the history, whether it's recent or in the past. Uh, we have a large middle class. We have educated urban people. Women in Syria status is much more empowered than other Arabic countries like Yemen or Libya and, and so forth. Um, we have a large Syrian diaspora in the United States and, and Europe and the Gulf states who, can, who are ready to contribute and to help in rebuilding uh, society. We have 7,000 Syrian American physicians. Uh, many of them are members of SAMS who are ready to provide their skills and training and wealth, and they've been doing that over the past three years to help rebuilding. We have a large, diverse society. We have 29 different ethnic and religious groups in Syria. We have a large Christian community that is considered and perceived as an asset to Syria. Syria used to be an oasis uh, in the middle of a very stormy Middle East in terms of interfaith relations between Christians and Muslims. We're proud of our heritage, we're proud of our diversity, but we need to be given the chance, uh, to, first of all, to end this crisis and transition, hopefully, into a system that allows Syrians to um, show the region and the world that they're able to build their society and they're able to uh, become a modern uh, society where everyone is respected, everyone has equal right. I mean, all of you have iPad and iPhone, 
which is the product of a Syrian immigrant or a son of a Syrian immigrant. Steve Jobs is a son of a Syrian immigrant. Uh, and he succeeded because there is a system in this country, this is a great nation, that allow you to nurture your uh, creativity and so forth. And we believe that many Syrians have that in them, but they need to be given the chance. Thank you. Kathleen? I, well, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with a different one uh, because I agree. <laughs> I, think the, I think the greatest hope is in the, the Syrian people themselves and, and their traditions and their ability to live in a, um, a multiple, multiple religious society and, and uh, to coexist peacefully. Um, I will just say on the U.S. side, I guess I, it won't sound like it's hopeful because it's born of a lot of negativity, but I do think we're, we're in fits and starts moving toward this recognition in, inside the United States of the importance of the Syrian crisis for the rest of the region and for U.S. Mm -hmm. position and credibility in the world. I think we're moving in fits and starts to this, to this importance of um, showing uh, other countries in the world, as well as the Syrian moderate opposition, that we do care and that we do want to take on some kind of a more substantive leadership role than we have. Um, and I have great, immense faith in the American people and their um, incredible generosity. Um, the, the, the dollars were, were mentioned before, but I think that will continue both in terms of what is given in official aid and in terms of American supporting NGOs that are out there um, working the front lines. Great. Well, thank you. This has been a very rich and I think in the end very constructive uh, conversation. And, Thank you for taking time to be with us. Please join me in thanking our speakers. So we're adjourned for the day. Uh, thank you all for coming and being with us through, this, through these series of uh, roundtables and discussions.